So now we're going to go to our next speaker, who is Sarah Fillimore. She is a um, family law barrister and member of Fair Cop. And we're going to talk about and um, have a discussion about Sarah's some of Sarah's expertise. Um, the Rachel Mead case, what can we do, do when the law is ignored? So first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on. Can you tell us about your work as a barrister and how you know about the Rachel Mead case? And is it correct that you were the lawyer for the Rachel Mead case? I'm a family law barrister, so I mainly do child protection cases. So there's obviously a lot of intersection with my work and with human rights. So I know my way around um, the European Declaration and the Human Rights Act. I'm not a specialist in equality discrimination law, but I feel like I'm becoming one um, the more that I read. I was involved in Rachel Mead's case, but at the fitness to practice tribunal stage. For those who aren't familiar, I'll just give you a quick um, overview of the facts. Rachel Mead was a social worker. She had a Facebook group, which was private, as all social workers are advised to do. Keep off social media for obvious reasons. You're dealing with vulnerable service units, children and adults. Not a good idea. Private Facebook group. In June 2020, one of her Facebook friends made a complaint about Rachel to her regulator, who's called Social Work England. That complainant was a trans-identifying female called Aidan Walton, who is now the strategic lead at Sports England for Diversity. So remember that point, that, that's quite significant. Rachel was then plunged into an investigation. This was before Maya Forstarter's successful appeal. So Rachel initially um, bowed down and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, because she didn't want to lose her job. She was the breadwinner. So she she bowed and she scraped. She said, I'm ever so sorry, ever so sorry. And she received some sort of sanction and written warning. But then the four stars of judgment came out and Rachel thought, hmm, hang on a minute. Nothing that I did was problematic. The posts that she'd been sharing on Facebook were links to petitions, say for fair play for women. But Aidan Walton said fair play for women were a hate group. And, and that therefore that Rachel was supporting discriminatory practices. After the full start of judgment, she thought, no, I'm not having this. And so she refused to accept the sanction. Social Work England then decided she had to go to a full fitness to practice tribunal to consider whether she could even remain as a social worker. So that's what happened in October 2022. And that's when I came on board because Rachel was also considering going to the employment tribunal, was trying to raise money for that. It's hellishly expensive. So the Bad Law Project um, paid for me to represent her. I was absolutely shocked and horrified by what I read. I've sent you a link to my most recent Substack post, which has got in it links to a previous Substack post where you could see some of Rachel's posts and a link to the judgment of the Employment Tribunal and also a link to the submissions I made to the Fitness to Practice Tribunal. That's via the EBSWORK website. That's the Evidence-Based Social Work Alliance. So if there are any social workers in the audience who are feeling a bit lost and lonely, then get in touch with EBSWA because they, they'll support you. Uh, the thing that made my jaw hit the floor when I was reading a statement of Social Work England was the usual, oh, she's a bigot, she's awful, you know, can she even be a social worker? She doesn't accept that a gender recognition certificate means that the holder is a legally socially and biologically the sex they claim to be now my jaw hit the floor quite quite literally i don't think i've ever gasped out loud remember this was a statement written by social work england in july 2022 so one year and a month after the judgment in full starter which set out very clearly what a grc does and does not do for those who are not um, in England and Wales, a gender recognition certificate is something you can apply for if you want to be recognised as the sex which is opposite to the sex that you were born. And that clarifies your position in law. It sets up a legal fiction that you are, you're born a man, but you're now claiming to be a woman. But that legal fiction can be disapplied in a variety of circumstances, sport being the most obvious. It most definitely does not mean you change biological sex. That, that's magical thinking. It's medieval. And to see it in a statement of case from a very powerful regulator 
of a very necessary and important profession was utterly shocking. And the other shocking thing was, of course, at the Fitness to Practice Tribunal, Social Work England were represented by Robin Moira White, a trans-identifying male barrister who appears to have developed rather a monopoly in these cases and I think is a big part of the problem that we're now facing. Because the Fitness to Practice Tribunal was one thing, the Employment Tribunal is quite another. And um, Rachel was represented extremely ably there by Naomi Cunningham and Cole Kahn solicitors. But what I think I really need to emphasise about this Fitness to Practice Tribunal is I was raring to go. I was so excited. It was going to be live tweeted by Tribunal Tweets. It was shooting fish in a barrel doesn't even come close. I, I wouldn't have to do anything to utterly humiliate my opponent. And for a barrister, that is the sweetest, sweetest feeling. That's what we live for. And it's rare because normally your opponents aren't stupid and they've got some pretty good arguments of their own. But what went, then happened when we got to the tribunal was the Social Work England applied to discontinue on the basis of new information. And I said, mm, uh, come again. What new information, please? The new information was apparently they hadn't realised that her Facebook post was private. She told them it was private two years ago. They hadn't realised what the contents of the posts were. Um, they'd had them since June 2020. So they hadn't bothered to read them. They'd just taken Aidan Walton's um, word for it, that they were deeply offensive and bigoted and discriminatory. And the third reason was they hadn't realised that Rachel was such an exemplary social worker and had got such brilliant character references. Again, complete bullshit, if I may use a technical legal term. They'd had the character reference for years. This was a device. It was a device to escape humiliation. I objected. And it was a bit of an odd position for me to be in because they were basically saying, we're not going to continue against your client anymore. We're withdrawing our case. But that wasn't a victory because the reasons they gave were utterly dishonest. They knew they were not merely going to lose, but they were going to be humiliated. So they confected a reason to withdraw that was allowed by the tribunal. I've rarely been so furious and exasperated in all my professional career. This was dishonest. This was profoundly dishonest in an attempt to escape a well-deserved humiliation. But OK, take a deep breath. You know, I, I, I didn't get my day of glory, which I'm still sore about, but that's not important. What's important, that Rachel, who'd had this hanging over her head for years, was told by her regulator they were not going to pursue a case against her. That makes what happens next all the more remarkable. Because Social Work England and Westminster City Council, her employer, did not back down. She was taking them to an employment tribunal um, for discrimination and victimisation. She had been suspended for a year, luckily on full play, but it's still no joke as a social worker when you're depending on evolving practice to be suspended for a year. It must be horrible. Not only that, but her manager and another social worker were also suspended for not reporting Rachel for her grotesque and shameful posts. So it was obvious, I think, as Michael Foran said, I was um, with him on Andrew Dawes' show on Sunday, potted plants could have won Rachel's case. No disrespect to Naomi Cunningham and the team. They were excellent, but he's quite right. It was an open and shut case of overt victimisation and discrimination on an unlawful basis, which was known to have been unlawful since the June 2021 EAT decision in Maya Forstarter's case. It was incredible. Why they went ahead, I don't know. Robin Moira White was not, I understand, involved in the employment tribunal, but some lawyers out there are advising Social Work in Westminster City Council they had a case. Or... Some lawyers are desperately trying to get them to back down and they're refusing. Either way, that's really, really frightening. And the thing that really triggered me into feeling more and more fear was somebody sent me an internal blog written by Sarah Newman, who's the head honcho of Westminster City Council. I don't know her title, chief executive or something. Um, that means she's also responsible for Kensington and Chelsea. So two large London boroughs. She's responsible for hundreds of staff, thousands of vulnerable children and vulnerable adults. And in her blog, she wrote about her trans-identifying stepson. 
And that really is, as Helen Joyce says, problem that we have here. A lot of these people in positions of power and influence appear to be motivated by the fact that they have a child or know a child who is trans identifying. And that seems to be the cue for all logic, reason and obeying the law to go out of the window. So it was really, really shocking to see that. I don't know why they thought they had a case. They tried to argue that four starters said, you're allowed to think these evil turf thoughts, but you're never allowed to talk about them. Robin White commented on the Employment Tribunal judgment saying, it's hardly seismic. Um, <laughs> all it did, I mean, in terms of its legal impact, it's nothing. It simply restates what we know to be the law. Rachel had every right to go on a private Facebook group and share newspaper articles from the mainstream media to donate money to petitions about women in sport. She had absolutely every right, and she would have every right to do that as an identified social worker. So all the, the Mead case did was simply affirm what we've always known to be true. But that's why it's of such huge practical significance and also why I think it sends a gloomy message for how the rest of our time is going to go. The fitness for practice, which was not allowed to carry on or they withdrew, if they had done that fitness to practice um, hearing and you had won, would there have been uh, like more precedent? Would that have sort of been made public and we could have used that as a precedent? Or, well, no, or is that again... Because I knew I was going to win because this matter had already been dealt with in the case of Felix Nagole, a student social worker who was devout Christian and had pretty Old Testament views about homosexuality and expressed them on his Facebook group. Now, Felix Nagole had to go all around the houses, but eventually ended up with, I think, the Court of Appeal agreeing that because there was no evidence that he had any kind of discriminatory practice in real life, and he was very clear to to make it clear, he worked with gay people. He did not allow his Christian views to impact on his practice. Now, I appreciate it's it's difficult, the more extreme your views are, to see how you can do that. But there was no evidence before any tribunal court that Felix Nagole discriminated against homosexuals. As a Christian, he has a protected characteristic and a right to believe as he did. So we already had the law. The law was already there the same thing for Harry Miller. You asked him one of the questions. Yeah. What's the interplay between Force Starter and Miller? Well, they're both very similar in that they are fundamentally restating the importance of Article 10 in the European Convention of Human Rights. And for Americans, they will have um, the first article of their constitution. Freedom of speech is the right upon which all other freedoms depend. If you cannot talk about things, if you cannot meet people who agree with you and associate with them and talk about things, you cannot protect any of your rights. So the freedom to speak is universally recognised as absolutely fundamental to any functioning democracy. So Harry Miller was dragged over the coals because he tweeted um, something about Jenny Murray. He retweeted um, a song lyric saying, your vagina is made of, your vagina goes nowhere, your breasts are silicon. And he was visited by a police officer um, to say that he committed the most vile hate speech, which, according to the police, is only a few steps away from actually going out and murdering trans people. So, of course, he had to be dealt with. So Harry Miller, um, the Court of Appeal, reaffirmed the importance of Article 10, said that the way the police had acted was unlawful. Rachel Mead, again, it's more about her Article 10 rights and how there's absolutely no clash as a social worker for her to state that biological sex is real and it matters and that women have a right to single sex female spaces. These are absolutely proper things to believe and to talk about. So Miller, Forstarter and Mead are all examples of individuals having to go through years of hell and enormous financial cost to simply reaffirm the law that was already there. And that's why as a lawyer, I'm really worried because you asked me, Joe. well, mm. brilliant. You know, we've got Mead. Surely, surely we're at the end of this nonsense now. I mean, Fair Cop have analysed what's been donated to these grassroots activist cases in England. 4.5 million so far. 
Now, just think what that money could do. And of course, that isn't anywhere near the full cost because a lot of those lawyers would have been working at cut rates or have done some pro bono work. It doesn't say anything about the hours and hours and hours of these people's lives taken over by this. Think of all the time and energy wasted, diverted and simply trying to protect what should already have been there. The Mead case shouldn't have happened because the lawyers should have read the Harry Miller case and the Four Status case, which said, in our law, we are allowed to have beliefs. As long as we don't go around being really, really like walking up to people and harassing yeah. them, yeah. we're allowed to have our own views. But that was ignored. And I sort of get the feeling they're just they're just going to keep going until they get the result they want. Like uh, uh, it, It's a form of grinding a stand. Because what's happened is the state ought to be stepping in. Um, the Equalities Commission ought to be stepping in. The government ought to be stepping in to leave it up to individuals to take on state agents to protect their fundamental rights. There's going to be a time when we are all exhausted and we haven't got any more money to give to these crowd funders. I wonder whether this is the deliberate tactic but I am both horrified and heartened in equal measure by the case that's going on at the moment with the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre. For those who are not in the jurisdiction and don't know, somebody who worked there was asked by a service user if a person with a male name was male. This person was a woman who wanted to be identified as non-binary. So the, the rape crisis worker asked in a very polite email, would it be possible to describe this non-binary woman as a non-binary woman, to reassure the service user. For that email, she was sacked um, oh, for gross misconduct, for hateful, bigoted, offensive conduct. Um, the woman who made that decision was cross-examined yesterday in a tribunal, again by Naomi Cunningham. And she claimed to never have heard of the decision in Forstarter. Now, she's a liar because she tweeted at the time how... Maya for starter made her tremble in fear. Yeah, not quite as fearful as the service user who'd been sexually violated by a man and wanted reassurance that there were not she was not going to meet a man out on the premises. I'm sure that woman's horror was a great deal more significant than the horror felt by a woman having her fundamental rights upheld. So we've now got to the stage where people are just prepared to lie under oath. Of course she knew about the judgment. Either she she thinks this is a way round it, because I, I think they're going to lose and they're going to lose big. And again, I'll be saying it's a case that should never have been bought. It isn't gross misconduct to ask how you might properly reassure a service user in the absolute epitome of single sex female provision. It's heartening to see um, that the umbrella organisation for these groups in Scotland has now thrown Edinburgh under a bus and deservedly so, saying, oh, we've always supported women-only provision, oh, except for the times when we didn't, but never mind that now. Um, we sense the wind is blowing in a certain direction. So like I say, I'm torn between being horrified at what's happened and heartened, because this may be another Isla Bryson moment for Scotland, where the public are brought slam, slap up against the hard brick wall of the reality of what it means to pander to male validation against the rights of women to their bodies and their autonomy and their thoughts. So Scotland, although it's been the architect of much of the insanity here, might actually again rescue us. Because as soon as people saw pictures of Adam Graham um, as Isla Bryson wanting to go to a female prison, um, the scales fell from many eyes. One worry, though, is that um, just in the way that the police don't implement laws around rape and they've managed to get away with that and and domestic violence um it seems as if they might be now the institutions might be saying okay well we don't really like these laws um and the, these these rulings but we're just going to keep going anyway um mm. and sort of claim lack of resources or claim incompetence and so we could get uh the rolling i mean i the rolling out and and then you like you say maybe we'll get so exhausted at taking the cases but de facto will be in a I, in many situations it's going to just be implemented yeah, outside the I, law i think there's there's a real distinction between the failure of the state to prosecute successfully offenses of rape 
and coercive control and what's happening at the moment. The problem with violence that occurs in relationships is the lack of evidence. And sadly, the court relies on evidence. And that's why a lot of these prosecutions will fail because, you know, the, the rapist will say, well, yeah, of course we had sex, but I thought she was consenting. And it is, it's very, very difficult in a legal environment to bring that forward to a successful prosecution. That's a failing, yes, but it's a different failing to what we're seeing at the moment, which is denial of reality and forcing other people to join in with your denial of reality. I think that's much, much scarier. With the unsatisfactory rate of prosecutions and rape cases, we can deal with it because we all know what we're talking about. Everyone's got the same language and the same goal. But if the people in power are saying, oh, that's not a man, it's a woman, when you can see with your own two eyes, it's a man, there's no proper discussion to be had, is there? It, th there's no way forward because somebody is saying, you have to believe, you have to cooperate with my delusion. So it's a problem on a different scale, a different magnitude and a different kind of horror and I think unless we can get that driven out of our public bodies and our police forces, we are not going to be able to do anything about the current approach to rape and coercive control with which many people are highly dissatisfied. So I, I think it is important to keep that distinction. There's a yeah. failure of a system, which is probably down to resources or evidential difficulties. And there's this mass terrifying delusion that we can just wish reality away if we want to. And that's so profoundly dangerous. It is it is literally driving everybody mad, even the people who want to believe it. I mean, I tried to join a space last night on Twitter with some bloke in America who's got a PhD in genetics and was going to talk about sex. And I thought, well, I might learn something. Within 10 minutes, he had descended to foul-mouthed rage and talking about Colin Wright was speaking and, you know, making the obvious point that sex is about the way the reproductive systems in your body are organized. This was called bullshit, you know, swearing. And I thought the guy was going to have a heart attack. See, it is driving everybody mad. I, I don't understand who this is actually helping apart from a very, very small group of people. But I am I'm, I'm quite worried about where we're going because not only should Mead never have happened, nor should Forstarter, nor should Miller. And there was, I think, a very naive article in The Guardian of all places, at least they're recognising it, saying, oh, don't worry, it's just been a bit of a blip. Everyone's going to get trained properly and these cases will stop. But the people doing the training are Stonewall and gendered intelligence. So they are going to carry on misrepresenting or ignoring the law. And these cases are just going to keep coming until, Joe, as you say, we are all so exhausted. You know, we won't even be able to scrape together another tenor for a crowdfunder. I know a, a, a teacher who is a trans rights activist and um, she uses the term, uh, she says she promotes the idea that gender identity is a protected characteristic and so I was saying so in discussion I was saying but it's not it's not a protected characteristic it's gender reassignment and she said oh well we just use gender identity because it's better and I go yeah but it's not the law you're just changing what's and, and she said yeah well well it's just better it's just better so that's what we're doing and it it seems as if quite a lot of professionals are are so in their own bubble of what's good and bad that they're quite happy to be moving reality beyond the law in the way that, that like yeah. and, and that is horrifying because it's the end of law it, the rule of law we we can trace that directly to stonewall's guidance stonewall very cunningly said to people what you need to do is go above and beyond the law be better what it cannot do is assert supremacy over sex ever there may be some situations where it's on a par with sex. But when we're talking about rape crisis centres, sports, anywhere, as Professor Smith says, when I'm going to sleep and I'm just going to go sex has primacy. So we've got this awful hot mess of people actually being told that they are good and they are noble for going against the law. Because we know the law takes its time to catch up with societal mores. I, I get that. But... If we just abandon the law and if we start making it up as we go along, which is what Stonewall have told everyone they can do, and it makes them morally righteous if they do, 
you see why we're in such a hot mess. You see why we're going round and round in Groundhog Day. Because I'm sure nobody at Social Work England thought, <laughs> let's just ruin Rachel Mead's life because we're bastards. I'm sure they all thought, oh, this is king, a social worker who's exhibiting discriminatory practice. We must act. Problem is, they were ignorant as to the law. And by attempting to root out discriminatory practices, they practice themselves a really gross and serious form of bigotry and discrimination. Yeah. And, and I think you, men you mentioned that the ruling in the Mead case is that they actually turned it around and said that, is it Social Work England or Westminster Council had actually done, like they'd been discriminatory against me, but they Both. went further. Yeah. Both institutions had harassed, victimised and discriminated against Rachel Mead. And that's why I'm just aghast when they'd had the very clear warning from the Fitness to Practice Tribunal, because I was very kind and helpful. I led them paragraph by paragraph down every avenue where they were wrong. So they'd had it spelt out to them by me in October 2022. And yet they continued so either they're getting very bad advice or they're not listening to the advice they're being given. Either situation is frankly terrifying because these are huge organisations with huge power. If Rachel Mead had been um, expelled as a social worker, she was the breadwinner in her family. You can imagine the pressure on people. That's it. You know, you cannot practice in the job that you've given 20 years of your life for which you were said yeah. to conduct yourself in an exemplary way. So there is something very, very wrong still happening. And it's just incredibly naive, as the person quoted in the Guardian article said, oh, we're coming to the end of it now because everyone's just going to get trained up. No, they're not, because this isn't just about training. This is about telling people what they're doing is morally good. And that's very, very hard for people to let go of. Once they've been told a certain course of action makes them righteous. You know, this phrase, the right side of history is thrown at us all the time. Oh, you'll be on the, you won't be on the right side of history. It's very, very powerful. And it allows people to shut their eyes to the real evil that they are doing. Because you can't argue with them. And they won't think. There'll be no reflection. Because what they're doing is right. So I have to give enormous grudging respect to whoever it was that cooked up all of this with the Yoga Carta principles and because they've really done a number on people's brains. It's been an extremely successful takeover. I mean, these people who are getting the law so horribly wrong are not stupid. They're highly competent, highly trained, mature people. And I mean, all I can think of, I saw some horrible picture of this poor um, caterpillar, or, or no, a snail wandering along, and it had been infected by a parasitic wasp, and the wasp controlled it. And there was this, the body of this poor snail being controlled, a, a zombie. It, I just keep getting that in my head. That's what's happening now. So either we're going to rescue ourselves as a society or we're just going to keep on and on and on having these cases. But I'm going to try and, and be positive and hope that the judgment in the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre case is going to be absolutely excoriating, sort of mead on steroids. And that may help people wake up because the thought that people going to a rape crisis centre are not allowed to believe the evidence of their own eyes that there is a man in front of them is one of the cruelest things that this ideology can possibly promulgate. And I, I just yeah. want to believe that people will, will wake up. What about internationally? Do you know what's happening internationally? And do you think, because we've got a large international audience on this webinar, um, do you think it's worse internationally? Or are you? Well, it, it seems to be. I mean, certainly in Canada, um, with um, Amy Hamm, um, Jordan Peterson going for re education, um, the case, I think, of the father imprisoned for objecting to his child's transition. Canada seems to be even further down the rabbit hole. The US, I'm utterly astonished, given their very firm commitment to freedom of speech. It's the foundation of the bloody constitution of the entire country. And yet the capture of gender identity ideology seems to be very much further entrenched 
in the US. And of course, um, neither Canada or the US, as far as I know, have anything equivalent to the Equality Act. And that's really been very, very useful for us. So I'm extremely worried about what's going to happen because obviously America is such a large and an important country. And what I wonder is driving America is that is their healthcare system is so very different and money talks. And certainly the amount of gender affirming surgeries carried out on even young girls in America seems very, very disturbing and not something I'm aware that's happening in other jurisdictions, which actually are rowing back against the medicalization and surgical transition of children. So it's, I mean, you probably all remember that that meme. Um, there was a picture of um, someone, had, had, the strength of transphobic tweets across the world, and they colored them in purple. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> and England, Wales, and Scotland were like, <laughs> this yeah. huge neon beacon to the world. And it, there's been lots of talk about, you know, why have people in Britain been more successful And, you know, there's all sorts of reasons I won't go into them. But this is such a huge battle. I think we've got to get our own houses in order. Of course, give whatever help we can to women all around the world. And I think there has been a lot of interaction and discussion between American and Canadian women. And, of course, you know, the utter sad tragedy is other countries are dealing with threats to female existence, such as denying them education and killing them. You know, and sometimes we have to remember how lucky we are, but also not to get complacent, because if our rights are removed in the way that some would have them, I'm not sure how far away we are from situations where we're then denied any voice at all or education. So I think you can so easily get overwhelmed because this is happening all over the world. Women are suffering in hideous ways. And I think get your own house in order, give what assistance and succor and support you can to your sisters across the globe but obviously we can't we can't fix everything and you can easily become just overwhelmed by the scale of the problem so what i've tried to do is just well just do something every day even if it's just a an angry tweet when someone says i'm transphobic i say well report me to the police then yeah you tried that you failed now fuck off (laughs) you know i'm getting increasingly more testy I'll try not to get too testy because obviously i've had my own run in with my own regulator that was two years of fun and they backed off because I think they saw that they were also heading for a very humiliating clash in a tribunal. But it's absolutely bonkers. I only got involved in this in 2018. It's what, 2024 now. I mean, yeah. we have made enormous strides. Things are changing. But Mead should never have happened. The Edinburgh rape crisis case should never have happened. These happened in defiance of the law. And that's yeah. really, really worrying. 